Welcome to Real Vision. I'm Maggie Lake here with Thomas Phillipson, the former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors and the Daniel Levin Chair of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. And we are going to talk about the outlook for the U.S. economy as we pull out of this pandemic era that we've been, or at least hope we are trying to, Daniel. And I guess that's where we're at, right? We keep thinking we're coming out of this. Um, but so far, you know, it hasn't happened. Let's start off by first characterizing um, where you think the U.S. economy is right now as we sort of look into 2022. Well, I think at the economy in the last two years has obviously been very pandemic uh, driven, right? Mm-hmm. So the, everything depends on is this really going to be the last wave with Omicron? I mean, it's very infectious. A lot of people now have natural immunity through this, uh, through a milder infection. But it, it's sort of two different types of forces, I think, dependent on what happens to Omicron, whether or whether, or whether that subsides quickly or whether it's lingering or we have another strain, I think. Yeah, I, I can't think... I mean, you know, you're you're an expert in in public policy, especially health economics. I can't think of another time that, you know, medicine and disease were as critical and embedded to the sort of the, the health of the U.S. economy as they are now. You can't talk about growth aspects unless you're sort of consulting with the medical profession at the same time. Uh what is going to be critical here, do you think, to kind of get the economy back on its feet? So if you look at what happened in the last two years, so economists are actually uh, much, I, I, my, I'm biased, obviously, being an economist, but I think we have a better framework and therefore also measure the impact of uh, the disease on the economy and overall in general. Typically, economists view a disease like a tax, and that sounds a little weird until you see mm. the analogy. So Think of a tax imposing a harm on the person paying the tax, right? They send in money, they don't want to send in money particularly. But also what a tax does is it it, it engages a lot of people in prevention. And it's the same with disease, right? So if you have a tax of a million dollars on airline tickets, no one's going to fly and there's no revenue to the government. But there's a major damage from preventing to be taxed by having to take cars all over the place, Mm -hmm. right? So it's the same with disease. Disease is basically a tax on activity in one way or another, particularly economic activity. So what happened was is you don't want to just track mortality and morbidity from the disease. You want to track the total harm of the disease, which includes two components. One is the cost of prevention, which, which is where the economy come in, because the cost of prevention has been mostly foregone economic activity. And then there's the cost of the disease itself, mortality, morbidity. Mm. So if you look at, when you ask what's going to happen the next year, if you look at how 2021 differed from 2020, in 2020, we had enormous cost in, of prevention from the disease. That is to say, activity not undertaken in the economy. It was about 80% economists estimated of the total cost and 20% being mortality, morbidity from the disease itself. That went down in 2021, not because the disease disappeared. We have more mortality in 2021 from COVID than we did in 2020, but because all the cost of prevention, or not all, but a lot of the cost of prevention got reduced. So we basically returned to economic activity. So the disease went up, but but the total harm from the disease typically measured by economists, prevention got reduced. So we basically returned to economic activity. So the disease went up, but but the total harm from the disease typically measured by economists went down. And I think that's going to not what's going to happen in 2022, if you want to look at the overall picture of those two trajectories. If Omicron is the last wave, and we've been saying this is the last wave for several waves now, so we don't know. But if it is the last wave, then you will see, you know, both of them ticking down quite dramatically. And we will have, even though we had a great GDP year, this year, in 2021, last year, uh, we will have an uptick in economic activity if if Omicron turns out to be the last end of this stuff. And I think that's a sort of natural continuation of what happened in 2020 and 2021. But I think economists have tracked this much better than the public health community, which is only focused on disease, obviously. Yeah. So I think that many of us 
you know, hoping that this is the last are are anticipating that maybe we'll get a a sort of V shape, right? Like what we've come out of it, life's back to normal, we're going to go back to normal and we'll get the economy healed. Is it going to be is it going to look like that or are there lingering effects that are going to be hard to shake even if we can put the disease behind us? Is the economy going to take longer to heal? No, I mean, what, what has happened, when I talk, talk about the two ta- harms of the disease, meaning prevention and the disease itself, if you look at the prevention component of that, there's two things that have happened. One is private prevention. So you don't go to a party, you don't go out to bars, you don't celebrate uh, holidays with friends et cetera, or family, et cetera. That's one form of prevention, right? You just minimize face-to-face contact with a lot of people. The other form of prevention is the public prevention. That is to say, governments are stepping in and either mandating or undertaking policies to try to prevent the damage from the disease. And that has not always been as efficient. Like John Hopkins came out with a meta-analysis recently, I believe it was yesterday, which showed that you know the lockdowns have not been productive. And the economists knew this, and we had data on this in early 2020, that is to say a couple of months after the, after the March uh, shutdown in the US, or not shutdown, the guidance from the federal government. Uh, but that has not trickled through to the public health community. And, I, and another form of public response is in the policy space, right? We have enormous, we had massive fiscal responses to this pandemic. So if you look in 2020 and in 2021, this was the first time in a recession in 2020 that we had income growth of the population. Usually recession is income reduction. The reason we had disposable income growth, which is both government transfers and your private income, was that the government massively increased transfers, right? We saw, you know, starting with the CARES Act in 2020, all the way down through the uh, Rescue Act in 2021, we saw enormous fiscal response. And that made people richer from an economic negative shock, which is unusual, never happened before in a recession. Uh, And obviously that will, you know, that stimulated demand and that led to all kinds of issues, uh, including inflation. But in addition to that, the Fed obviously monetized that fiscal transfer uh, and there were supply restrictions in the last year, not only on energy, but also a lot of other uh, regulations that the Biden administration is imposing. They're far ahead of, you know, taking a first year look at different administration. They are far ahead of any ad- other in- administration in what's called economically significant regulations, meaning like regulations that are affecting more than 100 million in economic value. So anyways, the, the, the response, the government response to this pandemic wasn't always the most efficient, including induced inflation through monetizing the fiscal response. Yeah, it was it was, uh, a, you know, difficult trade offs. Right. So it wasn't efficient economically, but motivated by the desire to try to keep people safe. Um, in hindsight, we're getting a lot of data on on that that might influence the next, but happening in real time, um, you know, kind of a, an experiment for everyone. So when when we when we look at that now, um, you know, the the shutdowns are, the, the, are largely over in the way that I'm assuming are were the most economically damaging in here in the U.S. Um, what does that mean? Let's let's walk through some of the areas that it had an impact on. So what kind of is there a lasting impact, say, on the labor market? We're still seeing even Om- Omicron sort of making its way through some of the weekly jobless claims. We've payroll numbers that that likely will be affected with with by that. Would we expect to see a bounce back once we clear or is are there sh- things that structurally changed about the labor market? We know we have massive res- resignations going on. We have labor shortages. We have re- people rethinking their priorities. We've accelerated work from home trends. Will they do you anticipate that some of those will sort of return back to the way they were? Or are we looking at a labor market that's fundamentally different as a result of this experience? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, Maggie. But just just to address the the hindsight issue, this is not in hindsight. Economists documented in early 2020 mm. and summer of 2020 
both that the major cost of this was not the disease and that the fiscal response made pay people richer during COVID than, you know, in the middle of a recession. So it's, 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 it's viewed as a hindsight because the public health community is lagging in their understanding of the total harm of the disease, in my opinion. Right. And, 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 but this was documented. I wrote op-eds in early 2020. I presented data in mid summer of 2020 on the fiscal over response, et cetera. So I don't think it's hindsight. I think people understood this in the middle of, uh, in the middle of what was going on. It's just that people were, were paying attention more to public health authorities than they were to other people at that time. And then you had the great right. Barrington declaration, the public health community is starting to turn. But I, my question, I guess, is if, if you didn't shut down uh, and you don't know what that would have done to the public health cost, uh, uh, you know, if it hadn't happened because we didn't go through it, right? That, that's just my, my observation. The, the common argument is that when you have a, you, when you have a communicable disease, we, need, we have what economists call external effects that you don't take into account. They might harm others, and therefore we need to have the government come in and control you, mm. essentially. So think of highways, right? We, we don't shut down highway mortality just because we have a bad effects of bad drivers on the highway. We try to target it better. We, we regulate drunk driving. We have speed limits, et cetera, to try to reduce that mortality, but we don't shut it down. We don't shut down highway travel, even though that would have been a better public health measure. Fewer people would have died on the highways. Right. But coming back to your, your sort of lasting effect uh, of what, which is a very, very good question. A lot of people are, are sort of concerned about that. So what happened with, you know, uh, all the labor or the leisure subsidies, whatever you want to call the welfare programs that came in because people were not going to work. That's not only unemployment benefits, it's also food stamps, uh, child tax credit and the direct cash payments that people got. So many things that people usually work for, they did not have to work for in the pandemic. And that obviously discouraged people to go to work. And if you look at small businesses, you know, the three or six hundred dollar checks people got per week amounts to a seven to fifteen dollar an hour raise for their workers to compete mm -hmm. with the government. So the main competitor, really, I think, during the pandemic for small businesses was the government in terms of getting their labor in uh, uh, or get uh, retaining and also hiring labor. So that's a that's a thing that doesn't sort of tick off immediately once these welfare payments go off because it's obviously much easier to raise wages than to cut people's wages once, once they started working for you. So I think we see a little bit of a hangover of that in the employment cost indices that came out last week and a couple of months before that, where employ employers really have to, had to compete with a much more generous government mm -hmm. uh, in terms of hourly pay for not working uh, compared to hourly pay for working. And that is sort of what you see in the cost indices going up for employment. And once the cost of employment goes up, the, the employment costs go up, that has to be pushed on to higher prices. So, so that's part, it's not the entire inflation story, but it's certainly part of the inflation story that we suppress supply with these measures. Mm. I, I think I, I have the same questions about the supply chain um, in that, Will we expect things to return to normal? Or again, has this experience either changed the nature of the supply chain or uh, maybe shed light on, on things that were not working anyway we're, a, a, and were strained and precarious? And, and now, now we know that and it's changed our behavior in terms of inventories. No, I think the private sector is going to adjust quickly. When there's money to be made, the private sector adjusts and they're going to fill the goods that are needed. I don't, I, that's a temporary effect, in my opinion. What is not temporary is that, which is kind of interesting, which is we needed an epidemic to understand more efficient ways of interacting. So, for example, I think the, the, the business trips to go two hours to New York for a meeting from L.A., mm. th those days are over, <laughs> you know. So the electronic communication that basically took a huge uh, gain from uh, the pandemic is here to stay, I think. But it's kind of curious that we needed a pandemic to realize the efficiency gains of interacting through video as opposed to uh, in person, I think. And I think that's there to stay. There's also a bunch of other 
things in terms of telemedicine is here to stay yeah. because people don't want to necessarily, especially in the rural areas, it's here to stay because people have an hour or two to drive to the doctor, et cetera. So I think there's certain efficient aspects uh, that the pandemic facilitated through telecommunication. Uh, but the inefficient aspect of the bottlenecks in the supply chain, you know, with a profit driven economy, that's going to be money to be made by filling those orders. And I think that will subside with time quickly. It's interesting you bring up that the technology and the digi- you know, the, the sort of accelerated digitization that we saw, because we did see productivity numbers, the most recent batch come in stronger than expected. And, and they had been weak. So you know, could we become more productive from this? And that would be a positive, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, imagine the number of meetings you do on Zoom compared to that. You you couldn't do that in person, really. So that's part of it. I don't know. I haven't I, I don't know if there's studies or analysis out there to see what how big a part of that that is. Uh, but it's certainly true that uh, some of that telecommuting whether for client meetings or for within the within firms uh, are is here to stay, and some of the telecommunication between customers and and manufacturers or the telemedicine is, issue is also here to stay because it's just so much more productive and convenient. Mm. So, so do you think the U.S. economy are we are we looking to have a healthy year in twenty twenty two? You know, sa- save for the prospect of an unexpected new strain. But if we are able to move through this latest one, uh, do you think that the U.S. economy is healthy, is in a good state? Well, I think the biggest threat is obviously, which everyone talks about 24-7, is inflation, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, what caused this inflation? And is that going to be subsiding during 2022? And there's sort of three forces that operate operated to raise prices in 2021. The first one I already mentioned was that there was enormous demand subsidies or, you know, people's income rose in a recession. So when we came out of that and people were richer, uh, we basically had a huge uh, demand stimulus. Demand stimulus raises prices typically. In addition, we had a supply suppression in 2020 with a lot of payment for not working, including you know unemployment and all other benefits, including food, cash payments, and, and child ta- uh, tax credit, et cetera. And suppressing supply raises prices, right? That's the part of the bottleneck issue that you don't have enough supply around and therefore you have increases in prices. So two forces, demand going up, supply going down, raises prices. Economists typically talk about those price increases as relative price increases as opposed to inflation. Inflation, we typically think of a larger money supply, but that was enabled by the Fed as the third source of this coming in and monetizing much of the debt that financed the fiscal response. So the Fed is now sitting on a $9 trillion balance sheet or 40% of GDP, uh, which is historic as well. And those three forces basically have contributed. The the first two are more like, you know, if we have imported goods from China, that prices are going to go up because of the bottleneck. We don't call that inflation. We think of that as a relative price change. In particular, relative prices went up for goods relative to -to face-to-face services during the pandemic. Uh, But the real inflation, meaning broad-based price increases, Mm -hmm. We typically think of the money supply, which obviously increased dramatically with the Fed response. Mm. But now we have the Fed not only talking about raising interest rates, but reducing their balance sheet. We have the prospect of less, if any, stimulus, additional stimulus coming out of Washington. Uh, And hopefully we see the we will see some of those bottlenecks start to ease. Does that mean that we, we should see a reversal in inflation? Do you think inflation's already peaked? There's two forces, right? There's, you know, if they start, you know, um, selling off their balance sheet and if the fiscal measures stop, there's certainly downward pressure from that uh, with interest rates hikes as well. They're responding less in interest rates typically than what historically has been done to try to fight inflation. It's usually about two or 300 basis points there. You know, they have announced, I think, 75 basis points in 2022. 
So it's most many economists view this as a mild response relative to the 7% inflation that took place. Uh, but certainly those are operating qualitatively uh, in the right direction. What they're fighting is if Omicron is the last strain and we're now going back to normal, we're gonna have a heating up of the economy that counteracts that. Uh, and we'll see which one of those kind of wins out in my opinion. Yeah, it's all about timing, isn't it? Because things have a lag. You know, we're we're going to see a lag from all that fiscal stimulus that hit, but Fed policy will also have a lag. These things have to time up perfectly, sort of, to get us get that kind of engineer that soft landing that they're looking for. You think they can do that? Can we have a Fed that's uh, raising interest rates, reducing their balance sheet at the same time without pushing the U.S. economy into recession? Yeah, this is Milton Friedman 101, right? So, or even before him, ever, ever since the Fed started, economists, some economists have argued that, you know, there's no way you can fine tune an economy with Fed policy. First of all, they react too late to problems. So when they're reacting, they're just, the you know, usually when they're reacting, we're already in an uptick, which is certainly true now, right? We mm -hmm. had a huge growth year last year. Uh, so... And, and, and when they stop, it's too late. We're almost in a, in, 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 you know, in a downturn when they stop. So I, economists, some economists are very skeptical whether you know, 10 people in, or 11 people in DC can control the economy of 330 million Americans. You know? and, and if they're smart enough to kind of sit there and put on and on the, the, uh, the, <laughs> the, the sort of controls on the economy. And I tend to, you know, be in that camp. There's other people that think that, you know, clearly they have some power. They're not powerless, mm -hmm. but how good are they at, at timing these things? That's, I think, is very, very questionable. Yeah, well, they're, they're, you're using blunt instruments, right? Uh, that's what's at their disposal. So, um, you know. Well, they're, they're also bureaucracies. So bureaucracies take a long time to respond to problems, typically. And not always, but typically they do. And the private market moves much more quicker in responding to problems. So it's often time to bureaucracies can't keep up with the economy. And that's part of it. Not because they're on it. They're well intended. There's no ill intentions. Mm. And they're, they're very smart people at the Fed. Uh, but it's just impossible for for someone to do that. So, you know, what, one of the things it's, it's also difficult to uh you know, try to use policy to impact the U.S. economy when it's so interlinked with the global economy. And, you know, we may be moving out of AMI. We're not doing lockdowns anymore, but China is. We're seeing this play out in the Olympics. I mean, they're critical to the global supply chain. How much is the U.S. economy going to be influenced but what, by what happens around the world and how well their economies are performing? No, definitely. We always are. But, I mean, trade is about 15%. Uh, roughly of GDP, but so most of what we're doing is is being driven by our domestic economy. We saw our inflation uh, being much higher in the U.S. Uh, than other parts of the world uh, so far, uh, and one can wonder, you know, uh, why that is. And well, Europe first, came in pretty hot, I think, this week. I know, but we're 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 ahead of them. I mean, mm. in terms of cumulative inflation since the pandemic started. But and one can wonder why that is, and certainly the fiscal response and the monetizing of that is a you know major normal or natural, I should say, explanation of it. Mm. I wonder what you think about policy in regards to the fact that I think in in so many different conversations there's an attempt to try to figure out what to do for low income citizens, how to address uh, what's happened there, and. You know, people, whether you're talking about it, you know, what's happening through the obviously some of the fiscal, um, you know, policies that were put into place. But even now, you know, the Fed's very concerned about inflation because of the outsized impact it's having on low income Americans. Do you think they're taking that both the government and Fed policy makers are taking the right approach to try to address some of what's happening? Can they use their instruments to? to solve some of the problems that the low income groups face? That's a very good question. I mean, and we've looked at this a little bit. So if you look at what the White House is messaging, they're saying basically that they cut child poverty in half. 
which is simply not true in the data. That's a forecast that went out in 2021 that turned out not to be true. It went out in January 2021 and turned out not, be, not to be true. So basically what happened was, part of it was that the child tax credit, which was the biggest measure in trying to fight ch uh, child poverty, was eaten up. It was about a 7% gain in nominal income, that is to say dollar income of families, poor families. But the inflation was around 7%. So the real income, meaning after inflation, how much you can buy with your income, your purchasing power, was pretty much constant because of the inflation that took place. In addition, those measures you know, disincentivized work quite a bit. So there was about a you know, more than a million jobs, fewer uh, 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 people in jobs because of those measures, which also, which also had a, a negative income uh, effect on those families. So people have, there's a lot of research surrounding that. Uh, and it turns out that it, poverty hasn't moved much in 2021, despite the White House messaging. That messaging is now getting less and less frequent. So I think they're getting the message that that was a forecast and not an actual uh, event that occurred, but it gets to your point, which is you're trying to help people with nominal income gains uh, through welfare programs, but if that gets eaten up by the inflation, they're not much better off in terms of what they can buy. Yeah, but it sets up a situation where I think people are anticipating that maybe the Fed, in an attempt to help those hardest hit by inflation, are willing willing to, whether it's, you know, um, pursue policy that's going to hurt asset prices because that's more associated with the rich. It's kind of p pitting it against, uh, you know, to say, helping one group at the expense of another. And is that the right right thing to do? Do you think that's a correct assessment of what's happening? What, what's likely to happen with Fed rates? And what do you what do you think about that? The Fed has basically gone in a direction. So they they become a little bit woke. Obviously, they you know they incorporated discussions and had conferences on equity issues. They had conferences on global warming issues of Fed policy, et cetera. And those are worthwhile subjective to think about, but it's not in the mandate of the Fed to care about those things. That's a legislative issue for Congress uh, to decide on. And the Fed is charged with two things, which is care about employment and inflation. And they're now sort of doing a mission creep going on of caring about other things. And I think that's dangerous because it's not elected officials uh, yeah. at the Fed and, and the elected officials in the in the Congress should determine, you know, what is our climate policy? And that might well be an aggressive climate right. policy. I'm not I'm not taking a stand on which way you go. I'm just saying it's not the, within the Fed, Fed's purview to to concern themselves with those objectives. Where does that leave asset prices, though? Because it's not their mandate to make sure that the stock market continues to go up. It's a byproduct, maybe, of policy. But now there's a, this sense that there is, they call it the Fed put, right? That the Fed will come in to the rescue if asset prices uh, start to go down sharply and continue to go down. The view that funding companies only helps the rich, I also think is a, a little misguided. So, you know, half the population have pensions that hold these companies. Uh, and so it's a big participation, not necessarily among the very poor, obviously, uh, but it's a big participation in the electorate overall in holding uh, other com or in holding companies in terms of equities. In addition, obviously, when companies are doing well, workers are doing well. So, you know, having financing sources for companies through the exchange from uh, public markets uh, presumably benefits workers quite a bit. So I think that the the it's a misguided discussion by helping the rich by uh, paying attention to asset markets. A lot of times, the cost of capital is really helping. A lower cost of capital is really helping the the poor because it drives labor demand. You know, once you invest, you have higher workers, and a lot of the gains from those lower cost of capitals many times go to workers. Economists have estimated, as opposed to the capital owners or or you know, the capital part of the company.
Yeah, great point. And to be clear, the Fed doesn't talk about its policy to asset price. It's the fear, you know, among people looking at this new rate regime, the end of easy money, and wondering if there's an either or choice there for the Fed to make. I think that's what that what what worries people. I also know that you you know you follow um you know the drug pricing conversation as well. Um, the House did pass drug price controls. Um, a, a big question as to whether it would be able to get any further. Um, do, do you think, again, that's that's the best way to try to address some of the um, pain that's been felt by Americans as they deal with prescriptions? Or, or is there another policy you think would be better? Well, the thing I always say about drug prices is that what matters is the price of health, not the price of health care. So let me explain what that means. That might sound a little bit cryptic. So Really, if you look at HIV, if you look at hepatitis C, if you look at breast cancer, et cetera, 20 or 30 years ago, if you were struck with one of those, you could not buy a longer life anywhere on the planet. And you basically were faced with a what equivalent to a prohibitively expensive cost of prolonging your life. So what innovation comes in and does is, is basically economists view innovation as lowering prices for health in this case. So now if you're HIV positive, if you have breast cancer, et cetera, <clears throat> you can buy a longer life through healthcare. And that's presumably a price reduction for extending your life. So the, when you're balancing, so obviously when, if you clamp down on drug prices, you will destimulate innovation. Everyone agrees on that. That's just rate of return on investment. If you don't get a rate of return on investment, you're not gonna invest in medical R&D, which is a very costly process. It talk, takes about $2 billion to bring a drug to market. You're not gonna do that unless there's a payoff at the end, returning the capital to those investors, just like anyone would drop their pension if the pension went negative uh, year over year. Mm. So we understand that there's a negative relationship between price controls that are being proposed and innovation. And then the question becomes, are you actually gaining something uh, from that in terms of how much more costly does health become in the future because you don't, you're not innovating as much relative to how ch much cheaper health becomes now for seniors or others. Most of the most of drug consumption is from seniors uh, and and they are definitely better off. AARP are in, certainly in favor of these proposals. And when they come out, the question is 10 or 20 years from now, do you have you know, deaths that wouldn't occur without the price controls? And that I've argued, you know, if you look at the evidence out there, we have estimates, the profession has estimates on how much R&D get cut when you do these price controls. And if you look at this, we found that the proposed controls from the house would over, or over a 15 year period induce as much mortality as 31 times of COVID to date. So that's quite a lot, uh, you know, in terms of if you think of the numbers involved. Uh, so we had a lot of mortality from COVID, but 30, take 31 times of that, and that's the excess mortality you will induce the next uh, 15 years from not innovating in drugs or cutting the innovation sort of flow of new drugs coming on the market. Does there need to be more transparency around that? Because, I mean, I remember years ago doing a story about drug prices and advocacy groups would say that the drug companies spend more on sales and marketing and promotion than they do on research and development. And just a quick check of the numbers again, that, that argument is still there. And indeed, these drug companies spend an awful lot of money. I mean, you only have to turn your TV on at night and uh, for those who are still doing that, and you can see all of the ads. Um, do they need to be more transparent about the, the money spent toward R&D to, to make that argument? And, and you know, what do you say to the fact that the money goes to marketing and advertising? It depends on how you view marketing, right? Because many people learn about new treatments. Through, I mean, that's pure information. They want to get the information out there that people are undertreated. They can take this treatment and become better. Presumably, everyone agrees that's a good thing. That's not a wasteful spending. On, on top of it, in this market, we have an intermediary which regulates whether a customer can buy from a manufacturer or not. That intermediary is called a doctor. He's very well trained and presumably not perceptive to junk marketing. Right. And the question is, are you, is this marketing beneficial or harmful? And I'm, it's not clear to me that it's harmful, first of all, and therefore that they're spending more on marketing 
is a bad thing. So, so if that if if that kind of dry, drug price control um, were to get through and become legislation, um, you think it would have a, a, a very negative impact on the pharmaceutical companies? Yeah, no, it definitely. More more importantly, the patients. <laughs> so, I mean, the companies only make money when patients are better off. So the question is, you know, what happens to the cures that are not developed? What happens to those patients? And, and that's what this, we did a study that we posted at the University of Chicago, the Department of Economics is on the site if people want to go look at that, look at it. But basically that's this study which takes just, we didn't do the evidence. We take what the profession has produced over years as the evidence of the link between rate of return on medical innovation investments, which is what price controls killed, mm -hmm. and the reduced innovation. If you take that reduced innovation, how much life is lost from that not going on the market. I, we, we should we should close out sort of where we started, which is the health, a health report on the state of the U.S. economy. And, you know, based on where we are and what you're looking at and the sort of lingering effects of the shutdowns, um, w how would you rate the patient? You know, what, what where do you think the U.S. economy is headed and what are the things that you would be concerned about for 2022? So what a lot of economists is concerned about mainly is inflation. We had a great growth year. We had a great growth year in nominal terms. The problem was that inflation ate that up, right? So, uh, so the question is, can we? Is this inflation transitory, which is in itself can be very hurtful. Like if you have fixed income and your rent goes up from a thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars and then stays there, that is to say, you have no future inflation. You still hurt. So transitory inflation can certainly hurt people, certainly on fixed income where you don't have, uh, you know, nominal growth in the fixed income. But the question is if this is going to continue. And what people worry about there is this, what, you know, what we call self-fulfilling expectations. If, if workers, so you see certain unions now bargain for cost of living adjustments in their union contracts because they know that inflation is high. So if they don't get a cost of living adjustments, they're not going to be able to buy more with a, with a wage increase that they get. So if they put that in because they expect inflation in the future, wages will need to go up and that will need to be pushed on by companies as higher prices, that is to say more inflation in the future. And that's the, you know, the spiral that people are, are concerned about. Is that going to happen or not? Or it's, is it going to be broken one way or another? Is that your forecast? Do you think we're there or is it a little premature? I think a lot of con economists are worried with this high inflation that took place, and they're worried about not the, that they're not so worried about the uh, profit making sector not taking n not taking care of supply problems if 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 COVID goes away or bottlenecks uh, in the supply chain if COVID goes away. I'm not worried about that. That will be settled pretty quickly. What really is worrisome is all this money uh, floating around through the mon monetization of the of the $9 trillion that the Fed is sitting on. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today and your insights. So great to have somebody who's schooled in both of the issues that are really sort of vexing us right now. So thank you so much. Thank you.